The subject of gender-based violence is heavy in the air. The nation is torn on the subject, with even some members of the clergy feeling that whatever is done in the bedroom is nobody else's business. A woman or child's body was not created to be abused physically, sexually, or emotionally. And what about their rights? Who is protecting them? 35% of females worldwide are abused either physically or sexually. Globally, 7% of women are being sexually assaulted by a stranger. As many as 38% of the world's murder victims are women. In seven countries, 20% of girls 15 to 20 are victims of sexual violence from an intimate partner. We have the statistics. We know all about these gender-based violent crimes. But what's being done? Tonight, our topic is Mindset of Equality. And here to lay it all out on the line are members of the Women United Group. Women United was formed to push for the protection of women and children. Its mission is women on a mission empowering nations. Our guests from the organization are Chairperson Podesta Moore and Spokesperson Lisa Boswick-Dean. The topic is set. We will lay the cards down. You're watching On the Record. I'm your host, Jerome Sawyer. We'll see you on the other side of this break. project really pays itself back. Correct. They set up a, a um, at the conference, uh, uh, more uh, the school. As a journalist, I always have to focus on the facts, and sometimes that means going to investigate for myself. On the record, Thursdays at 8 p.m. right here on RTV. And welcome back. Our guests tonight are Podesta Moore. She's the CEO of the Bahamas Urban Youth Development Center, along with Lisa Bostwick-Dean, managing partner at the law firm of Bostwick and Bostwick. Ladies, welcome Good to night. On the Record. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. So first things first, let's uh, give a little history on Women United. What's the organization about? Why was it started? Um, some of the things that you all are hoping to achieve. Okay, so I'll start. Thank you for asking that very important question because I've had that question asked on numerous occasions. Women United started um, back in 2018. Uh, everybody know that I ran in the two consecutive general elections. And I realized that sometimes, you know, the politics of it tends to set you back. So I wanted to create an um, avenue where women can come together where we can put aside all of those things that divides us and separates us as women, um, one being politics, religion, the various schools you attend, all of these different things that separates us. The John one thing, groups, no, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes right. So when you look at that, but when we, when we consider the one thing that we all have in common is the mere fact that we're women. So if we can bring all of these women together, where we can be on one accord and speak with one voice and have that um, synergy as women to represent the, and, and advance um, the women's agenda, I think that we'll be more successful in our efforts to um, have a better um, country where we can take care of the needs of our, our families. Because uh, when women are empowered and we come together and we support each other, the strength is, is phenomenal. So it was that concept we had thought about. It's interesting you, you, you said that you, know, you left or put aside politics to form this organization. But do we find sometimes that because of politics, we can't come together to address issues like this, which affect everyone, regardless of, of political persuasion, religion, 
you know, whatever. Do we, sometimes do we find that, polit that, that because we are so politically divided and polarized, it keeps us from coming together to do these things? I would say absolutely 100% yes, Jerome. Um, which is why Women United is so powerful, because within the body, there are FNMs, there are PLBs, there are DNAs, there are Catholics, there are Baptists, mm -hmm. there are Protestants, there are whatever else. There's everybody is there. There are people who may not be practicing any faith. But yes, politics has um, divided us. And sadly, I think the most um, striking example of that in women's affairs would have been the first constitutional referendum. Um, the politics of it, women were not united in their call for equal treatment. And sadly, I believe that today we continue to pay that price. Um, similarly, the first time the marital rape issue was raised, and we're not going down there, but similarly, um, it was not supported by both sides of the aisle, um, by the women. Um, and so we are left fighting that battle today. But that being said, that is the history, um, and we certainly hope that's the history and that going forward, we hope that we have found a vehicle where we can speak with one voice. Mm -hmm. um, it's very important. Um, I joined Pro De well, the Women United organization uh, back in about 2019, early 2019. And then, of course, we went through a series of events, mm -hmm. Dorian, Dorian, and then um, pandemic. Uh, so the, the strength of the organization quickly revealed mm -hmm. itself, whereas initially, I will confess, I went in. I don't think Podesta has a signed up application for me. Mm -hmm. I went in kind of like, hmm, what's this? <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but, it, but it quickly revealed itself um, through those two events. And I'm certainly 100% on board. Mm -hmm. I believe that, you know, it is a potential vehicle for women to speak with a united voice mm -hmm. and to bring strength to multiple causes. So let's talk about some of the things that uh, you all are, are trying to do. I mean, you would have mentioned that you know, during the pandemic and during, you would have done some work. But you are, dem as an organization, demanding that the government keep its promises on a myriad of matters pertaining to women and children. What are some of these things that, that you're demanding that the, or you're attempting to, to keep the government accountable for? Before, before I just let Podesta mm -hmm. speak to that a little bit, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something um, a little bit more. A lot of these things we've been trying, or women, have mm -hmm. been trying to get traction on for a very long time. So this, while it's becoming very much more to the forefront now, this is something that persons like Sandra Dean, Dean Patterson, mm -hmm. Marion Bethel Sears, um, these are some of our forerunners, Janet Bostwick, my mother, that we've been arguing or asking for as women. For decades. For mm -hmm. a long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that that has to be recognized first. Um, but this recent push, um, I think, the, when you say we're asking and holding their toes to the fires, yes, government has, successive administrations have made numerous promises, but I dare to say that after some of the recent horrific, tragic events, sure. yes. in particular, I think, starting with Bella. When, we're we're going we're gonna to get to that, and we're going to talk to that, yeah. But mm -hmm. I'm going to let you, but yeah. then, you know, starting with Bella, we started to demand, and I think for the first time, yeah. to my recollection, an organization created a list of demands. Mm -hmm. And so, and we, we've tried to, with the organization, I don't know how many, Progressive will have to speak to how many organizations are within WU, but that collective grouping came on for seven strategic demands. So we, we've got to move, let's talk about what those demands are. And when I say government, I, I you know, it's not just this particular administration, but when we talk about government, I guess the, 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 the continuity yes. of, the, of the term government. But, yes. So what are some of those things that you, you are demanding uh, be addressed? Well, the first thing we understand that the Bahamas has signed on to conventions and treaties. And so we have an obligation to these treaties. And so we're saying that these are some of the things that the country, that you as the government has promised. We talk about the, um, the fact that all of the crime that's been happening, women and children are still being discriminated against, especially women, are being discriminated against. And you have an obligation to remove these discriminations. So one of the, the first demands, and Lisa have them listed out, but we even came up was to change our laws um, so that the sexual crime against a child resulting in a child's death is deemed by statute to be one of the worst of the worst. And we know we get a lot of 
um, you know, difference of opinions with that. Mm -hmm. When we talk about introducing the death penalty available so a judge um, can make that decision in a sentence. But we came up just um, recently last week where we sent an open letter to the Prime Minister, mm -hmm. and we sent it to the Minister of National Security, the uh, Attorney General, to the uh, Minister of Social Services, the Acting Director of Public Prosecutions, and the Commissioner of Police, asking and saying that the women have come together. We have 34 organizations that signed on to this letter. We have more organizations that's involved, but for this particular open letter, we had 34 organizations signed on, saying enough is enough. We've had enough of this. We're tired of all the talks. So one of the demands that we're, um, we're talking about is um, a legislation to support gender-based um, violence authority. That's within the gender-based violence bill that we have. This authority now will give some power to this organization to now support the organizations that's working with you know, gender-based violence. We talk about having shelters and safe houses. We get calls on a number of occasions every other day where women are in need of safe houses, they're going through abusive relationships, and they're having to be forced to stay in those relationships because we there's, there's no recourse. There's mm -hmm. no way for them to go if they decide to walk out of that relationship. So we can't tell them to leave. So I guess what I, I would like to do now is, is really go back a bit to talk about the events that have really prompted yes. this forward movement. Um, I mean, as you said, you've been around from 2018 working, but there have been some events oh, yes. as of, of, of late that have really, one, gotten the public's attention. Yes. Uh, but what I find interesting now is that it seems the discussion continues. I mean, as, as a journalist who's been around for a couple of years, you know, these heinous acts and crimes against women aren't Excuse. new, but, you know, as with any news cycle, you know, it, it rises to the top. People are outraged, and then something else comes along and, you know, people's attention goes elsewhere. But lately, we've had some things that have really continued mm -hmm. to, um, you know, rise to the fore in the news cycle, which is a good thing, but also in, 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 in discussions in, in, in public, among the public. You even see the discussions continuing online, you know, in social media. So, for instance, let's talk about um, the death of Bella. And, and that really started as the video of the woman who was run over um, by a car, and more recently, the woman being killed by her, her lover mm -hmm. um, while, you know, literally breastfeeding the child. Are you satisfied, even at this point, that, that violence against women and children, is this violence being addressed enough? Are we doing enough? Are we talking about it enough? It, it's, is there enough action? Uh, first of all, let me say this. We thank the fourth estate. One of the things that is causing this to keep alive is because they keep putting in front and center other heinous acts, which keeps the moral outrage high. So we thank the fourth estate. But answer your question, no. We really need, in particular, I would say, if I were to put my focus right now on two things, we need that dedicated court, Yes. that dedicated sexual offenses court, and we need a dedicated family court. We also need the passage of the gender-based violence bill, which will bring about the gender-based violence authority. Now, why do we need the court? Because we say that that will help more to be done. If people realize, perpetrators, that they will be prosecuted and see the full force of the law, when they commit these acts, then there will be some respect. That is not to say that that's all that needs to be done. It's not just about laws. And the original demands don't just deal with laws. We talk about the need for support, for psycho psychological support, mm -hmm. counseling, care, all these things. But when we speak right now, what two things do we need? Give us our court, fund our court, give us our court staff. If that can happen, women won't, if you're a victim of a sexual offense, Right now, you're waiting five years for your matter to be tried before the court. Mm. Five years. If you're a woman or a child or a young man or whatever, you're going to wait five years for your matter to be dealt with. When it comes up in five years, you're likely to walk away from mm -hmm. the situation. You've moved on with your life. You I don't want to relive, want to relive mm. the horror. In that five years, your perpetrator is most likely out on bail. Only goodness knows what happens then when you're out on bail. So we need, and, and there's, no, there's no answer to the offense. There's no seriousness. It's as, it's as though the society itself doesn't take it serious. 
if this is one of the worst crimes, this violation mm -hmm. of the human body, of the person, and yet you can't Savagery. see justice for five years. We want our court, and we don't want lip service to it. We don't want promises. We want a budget allocated. We want a room. Mm -hmm. We want a court facility, a judge, and appropriate staff. And accessible. Now, j sorry, just one more thing. What that also does is that can possibly stop or help the prosecution from not having to make plea deals so as not to blacklog the system. I know we have a concern about a plea deal. We're going to get to that in, uh, um, a little later on in the show. But very quickly as well, as we're looking to put, you're asking for this court, you're asking for legislation. What are you doing or is there anything done to address behavior? Because what you're talking about is dealing with all of this, uh, the end result now, you know, after someone has been violated or abused. But is there anything being done to address the behavior which leads people to do these kinds of things and to think it's okay? Yeah. Well, I just wanted to add with Lisa's um, conversation with regards to the court, we want to make sure that it's disabled, accessible, because we have a lot of our people who are mm. disabled and the courts are not accessible. So that's a challenge within itself. So we have to make sure and remember uh, that whenever we come up and create any systems or any places for um, victims to go, that it's accessible. It's accessible, right. You We're know, running out so, of time, but, but to the question though, behavior, how, what are we doing to address behavior? Well, we talk about the psychosocial support. We talk about having trainings. Um, a lot of, we talk with regards to the um, gender-based violence authority. This authority now will give funding to these NGOs that can have the resources now to continue to have these programs and activities in the communities, and intervention activities, psychosocial, support groups, counseling. So those um, types of um, programs are needed with, throughout the community. We just did a training recently with the Red Cross where we are going to have trainings throughout the community so people are sensitized and know how to deal with conflict resolution, with anger management, and address these behaviors. And it will start within the schools because you have to start from a young age teaching young kids how to manage these behaviors instead and, of being and, outraged. And very, very much needed. Ladies, we're at the point of our first break in the show. We have so much more to talk about. Yes. We're just getting warmed up. <laughs> uh, so stay with us. We'll be back right up. Project really pays itself out. Correct. They set up a, a, um, at the conference, uh, uh, more uh, the school. As a journalist, I always have to focus on the facts, and sometimes that means going to investigate for myself. On the record, Thursdays at 8 p.m. right here on RTV. You are watching On The Record. We're back with our discussion on mindset of equality. Our guests, Podesta Moore and Lisa Bostwick Dean. Ladies, as we ended our last segment, we were talking about a dedicated court and the legislation that you are advocating for. And I just want to say too, before we begin, many times on this show I say to people that we need more advocacy groups. We need people advocating more. And it can't be just in Parliament or on a political stage. So I applaud the work that you're doing in respect to this organization. And we need more. We need it for the environmentalist. We need it you know, for education. We need just people advocating outside of the political arena. But anyway, that's my two seconds on the soapbox. So let's talk about legislation. <laughs> <laughs> you want this legislation to support gender-based violence. Uh, sorry, a gender-based violence authority. How would this authority work? Well, the authority, Lisa has highlighted that so eloquently in mm -hmm. her speech recently, but this authority gives now um, power, it gives resources um, from the government. There's a fund, I was told, in the Ministry of Social Services that's just been sitting there for several years. I think it's mm -hmm. allocated like $2 million a year that's supposed to go into this authority, Jerome. 
that will now be able to provide training. So it'll help to support the NGOs that are working with gender-based violence in these communities. Wow. It can provide for the training, for the psychosocial support, for the anger management, for the conflict resolutions, for the employability skills, for the communication skills, and all of these things that's needed in our communities to help to empower our people so that they can you know, be able to help themselves. Mm -hmm. Even as simple as trying to find a job, having the right resume, so these, the, the, the authority now will have the resources available. They can also fundraise. They can support these different NGOs by providing requests for proposals to those organizations that's doing the work. And it helps to empower and strengthen the capacity for them to be able to provide the types of training in the communities that's needed. So taking the power out of government hands, they still monitor it because it comes under social services, but now it gives the power to the organizations to now trickle down to the people in the communities. I know that, you know, the, the in addition to the author, the legislation to create the authority, you want some legislation that's going to have uh, some teeth to deal yes, with some of things. Course. And I wanted to bring, and as you would have said as well, Lisa, the court um, to deal specifically with these matters. But I want to bring into the conversation two matters, which I think... Um, are the foundation uh, for why these things are needed. Um, there was a particular case recently of the trafficking of two young girls sold for sex. Yes. And the accused, the female, got nine months and three days on remand, as I understand it, and a plea bargain deal for three years on probation for having trafficked two mm -hmm. young ladies, underage young ladies, for the purposes of sex. Why is that so concerning? Um, Jerome, I think it almost speaks for itself. That for human trafficking and selling somebody for sex, it cannot be acceptable, in my opinion, for a three-year probation <laughs> sentence. Um, that sends completely the wrong message to society at large. And I suspect that something like that happens because of the pressures on the court system. I have not discussed this case with the public um, prosecution office, but I suspect that is what is in the minds of their minds as they're doing this. If we can move this matter ahead quickly, we can bring it to a, a conclusion so that we're not having it trapped up in the system. Um, additionally, though, what I would make a plea for, and I, I make a plea for this to our judiciary, when there's a plea bargain, the court has a discretion. We, as an organization, would ask the court to exercise its discretion to reject such a plea bargain. Absolutely. Why? But let's. I want to talk about this particular case and mm -hmm. why it was so heinous and what was uh, what was done to these young ladies. Well, according, I can only go based according to news reports. Sure. But according mm -hmm. to the news reports, the young lady in question, and just think of this: the bravery of this young girl. Mm -hmm. She was 16 years old when this incident alleged. Well, when it happened, because mm -hmm. there are now convictions in it. She asked her mother if she could go with a person who was known to her as her friend's auntie so-and-so. Mm -hmm. Her mother, understanding it to be her friend's aunt, said yes. When the lady took the two young ladies, it is said that she took them to a man's house where she then sold them for sex. This is all in the news reports. Mm -hmm. According to the young lady's evidence, when her friend said, but my time of month is about to start. The woman gave her three pills and said, no, no, we can't have that. Sold them for sex. The man takes her down the road, somewhere at the end of the road, Fox Hill. When he starts to take off his clothes, she says, no. He then says, I already paid you. I paid for this, according to the news mm -hmm. report. He then proceeds to rape her. He takes her back to his residence where he then later takes her uh, to the friend, to a house of another male where there are two other males, where he rapes her again and then leaves her with them and they or one of them have sex with her on the basis that he's already covered hey, the expenses mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for a young 16-year-old girl. They continue to keep her. How was she found? Her mother put in a missing persons report for this child and the young girl was found. And this young girl had the courage to go and give that evidence that I've just recited here in a court against her accused. Protesta, I'm, I'm sitting the here message. without mm -hmm. words. When something like this happens and when that, the, the punishment really mm -hmm. is 
three years probation. Probation. What message does that send yes. to the community? It's a very, very bad message that's being sent, and it's also discouraging to any person to come forward because they said, I'm going to go and put myself through all of this and to know that nothing really came out of it, that's a definitely, and I'm surprised that the, 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 national, the Department of National Security didn't, because they have a trafficking unit. I just spoke with someone the other day. So I'm surprised that that unit didn't even um, speak to this matter, to know that these young girls were trafficked. And then the, 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 the penalty didn't fit the crime, no way. So, you know, you know it's, it's awful, I can't even say. This isn't the Bahamas I grew up in. No. It hurts. No. This isn't the country that I know. When your it parents hurts. let you go no. with a friend of a or a friend of the family, mm -hmm. you were safe. It hurts. It's unthinkable. What, how, I'm without words, how, in what space do people think that it is okay yeah. to sell a 16-year-old for sex? Let me say this, Jerome, what alarms me about this case, and this is my thoughts, this is no insight, but what alarmed me about this case, Jerome, was I thought to myself, my God, how often would this happen? That they could be so comfortable that they could get away with this. Absolutely. How often is this happening? Absolutely. How often do we see pictures of young girls at the age of about 16 reported missing by their families. And how often, myself included, do we hear the stories that, oh, they were found in the company of a male, and the impression given that these girls just ran him. off yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, to have friend. an That's afternoon a or a weekend fast. of fun. Mm -hmm. yeah, these that makes, I see it all the time. Yeah, yeah these little fast girls mm -hmm. again. It makes me question everything I ever saw in that regard. I want, for that to happen, it suggests to me we have a trafficking problem. We don't. I'm alarmed by it. I, it, honestly, I can tell you until this case was in the news, this never entered my mind. Now, maybe that's my naivete. Oh, no. They but have truly, that list. I've had other cases. I've heard other cases, too. Back in the day, under the bridge, I, I, I witnessed. I witnessed a madam with the women, and she was connecting them to the various Johns. I, I, here's my I, thing. If, for you, if you are of age, and this is the thing that you choose to do, mm -hmm. that's one discussion. But a child. A child, yeah, a child. Because I, I, I know this, this case personally, because wow. during the time when she was missing, I got a call from the mother. So the mother was frantic, and she was back and forth to the police trying to find her daughter. So when this happened, I was like, you know, I thought at least they were going to get some results out of this, you know, seeing that the mother and the child was now going to, um, you know, file a complaint and ensure that this, these people got held mm -hmm. you know, accountable for their actions. And this is what came out of it. It's very you know, heartbreaking. So, uh, and let's, let's move the discussion forward. I mean, this, the, these are, you know, are heinous acts. Uh, but the work that you are doing, how is the work that you are doing going to impact all of this? How potentially can we put a stop to this? Uh, or how can we, what can we do to now, you know, <laughs> I'm without words. What can we do, or what can your organization do, and even us as a, as a community, as a wider community, what can we do to agitate for, for government and the authorities to pay attention and to put some things in place to stop these kinds of things? Well, exactly what we're doing now. We're holding each other. We're putting out demands. We're speaking with the, um, the Office of the Prosecution. We're speaking with the Attorney Generals. We're speaking with all of these people who have the powers, even to the top, the Prime Minister, to say you have to look at what's happening in our country and how it's impacting our women and our children. We have laws that we need to have enforced and strictly enforced. Right. Those things that need to be um, addressed, if we need to look at what's happening in the, on, the, on the records that's allowing for these things to happen, the penalty isn't sufficient. People are not taking this serious. They're going out, they're committing crimes. So you as the government, and we talk about to all of the, the seven female members of parliament, you have a responsibility. You represent the, 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 the population, especially the female population. And we're looking to you to go and fight on our behalf. So having them at the forefront and make, ensuring that the legislation is tight and intact and is considering all aspects, we talked about it even with the disability community, that you're looking holistic to see how we can put um, these measures in place and put the resources behind it to help these organizations 
help civil society to be able to do, because government can't do everything. Mm -hmm. I spoke with the Minister of Social Services the other day, and they said, you have to go ahead and decentralize some of these um, activities in the Department of Social Services. You have NGOs. Don't let everything, instead of telling people at 2 o'clock, services is cut off, that's ridiculous. Have a one-stop unit services where they can go to the various NGOs, register, get the services in, and that's in a system that's reported and uploaded to your department. We have to be creative and think outside of the box as to how we're going to fix these problems that's happening in our community. But it takes resources, and it takes a will mm. to ensure that it's happening. You said the word there, the will. Um, <clears throat> we have talked in, in this particular instance about... Um, a case involving, you know, the sexual trafficking yes. um, and exploitation of underaged women. But I want uh, the discussion now to expand a bit to cases involving violence against women. Yes. Uh, and the message sometimes that is being sent by how these matters are dealt with in the courts. It starts from the police, from the reporting, first reporting, mm -hmm. Lisa. We go into the police station. Sometimes the police look at you and don't take it serious. Mm -hmm. Even And it doesn't matter. We talk about removing discrimination. Even if I present myself as a sex worker, as an LGB, somebody from the LGB community, mm -hmm. you're still supposed to be able to take my report respectfully instead of making fun of me and saying, oh, what you've been doing, and then they don't take it serious. The police needs to do their job, and then that matter is turned over to the court. Front line. Front line, police. yes. Instead of discouraging you when you walk in that you don't even want to continue to file a report anymore. They make you feel worse than you felt walking in. And then we go on to the court system, which Lisa's probably going to talk about more. Mm -hmm. Once it goes to the police, I know they have the prosecutor, um, the police prosecution, where they handle certain matters, because we talk about even the case um, a couple of years ago with the young lady on the bus, with the bus driver, yes. when the $200 fine was charged. And he, he got a $200 a slap on the wrist. We, had to, we were outraged about that. Yes. We wrote a report to the, to the um, attorney general, to the DPP, and we, we like, no, this needs to be looked at and, and, and appealed. I don't think anything came out of it. But if these, these are kinds, the kinds of cases that we're looking at, and seeing how we can provide our advocacy to ensure that the penalty fits the crime, that people are not just getting a slap on the wrist. I'll, I'll, give you, point, sure. I'll give you a quick example about the process of the law. So when you get a charge and everything else, the very notorious case of the woman who was run over by her boyfriend while holding a baby in the road, well, that would have happened, I think, in November. That came up in February, and this is what, you see, this is what I mean by we have to understand what's being said when they say it. Oh, we're going to fast track it. Yes. What does that mean? We're going to fast track this matter. We're going to go by way of voluntary bill of indictment from the magistrate courts. All that means is that you're going to prepare the set of papers, the witness statements, the evidence, and you're going to pass it from the magistrate's court to the Supreme Court. But that doesn't mean that once it gets to the Supreme Court, that it's going to move any quicker than it normally does, which means three to five years. But here we go. That woman was run down in the road, the nation saw it. Three months later, when they appeared in court, they had to adjourn because the voluntary bill of indictment papers were not yet ready. So they needed more time to prepare the papers. So we haven't even gotten, mm -hmm. we haven't gotten off of first base. She was run down in the road, holding her infant in her arms. That's a case where the nation cried, we haven't gotten on first base. Now let me add insult to injury. When Vasily, was charged with murder. Yes. Vasily went all the way from her charge to conviction to appeal to Privy Council mm -hmm. in a space of, I think it was three years. It can happen. Yep. It can happen. We're tired of hearing excuses because I can name other examples where in criminal charges, the court has moved very expeditiously. And we are saying for our women, when we are run down in a road like a dog wouldn't be run down, make it move. Good point. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good point as well for us to take a break. If you're enjoying the show, you want to hear more, and I don't mean enjoying from an entertainment perspective, but if you're learning a lot.
project really pays itself out. Correct. They set up a, a, um, at the conference, uh, uh, more uh, the school. As a journalist, I always have to focus on the facts, and sometimes that means going to investigate for myself. On the record, Thursdays at 8 p.m. right here on RTV. We're back and you're watching On the Record. We're discussing mindset of equality and our guests uh, from the Women United of Podesta Moore and Lisa Bostwick Dean. Ladies, you also want a Victims' Bill of Rights enacted as well. What's the difference between this proposed bill and a gender-based violence bill? What is the difference? Well, the, the Victim Bill of Rights give rights to the victims. We have to make sure that um, all of the expectations, um, everybody know what their, um, their rights are in terms of I'll, I'll just read it here, mm -hmm. so that there's clarity in the rights, the obligations, and expectations of all our relevant parties. We wish to see that the general requirements for mandatory reporting, because a lot of times we have cases where a case is reported and the case is withdrawn. So that Victim's Bill of Rights helps the, the victim to understand these are your rights, these are what you are entitled to, and this is what the law, how the law covers you. So having that bill helps to explain that. A lot of times we don't know what our rights are. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that we are um, requesting um, in terms of gender-based violence. And why would it be important, though, um, for people to understand those rights? And you talk about the fact that you have instances where victims withdraw the complaint. Mm -hmm. uh, and what kinds of things really will lead to that or for the victim feeling mm -hmm. that maybe I don't have the right to do this or maybe I shouldn't or can't do this? From your experiences, what kinds of things uh, get will bring a victim to withdraw a claim? A lot of situations happen um, where victims are faced with the reality that if I, if I report this, who's going to take care of my children? Who's going to take care of my family? So I'm going to be left in the situation if I report this case and this man is locked up or, you know, then I'm stuck. Unless you are in a position where you are the, the higher income, <clears throat> you're able to take care of yourself, you're independently or financially <clears throat> secure, then you, you'll find yourself thinking about that twice. Understanding that there's no resources out there, there's no support system, um, I don't know where to go, there's nothing on a, um, another island where I can go where I'll still have a job, where I'll still be able to get my children in school and take care of my family. I think about all of these things before I make that decision, well, how, so I might have to withdraw that. How will legislation help that, though? These are practical things. If your husband is removed from the home and he's the breadwinner, um, uh, or, or whatever, or you decide to leave the home or whatever with your kids, how does legislation help that? Because that, that, not, that's a societal, uh, that's an income issue, that's all kinds of issues. I, I have nowhere to live, I mm -hmm. have to look after these kids. You know, how do you address that? The gender-based violence bills covers all of that. Mm -hmm. It puts everything in, in all of these protective measures in place where if you're a victim and you come forward, then we have resources to put you in a protection, protective environment where you can now be connected to that new society. And most of the cases, times you have to be moved from the island. Because if it happens in NASA, we have cases in, in family islands now where persons have to be moved from that island to the other to be safe because the perpetrator is right there. So this, 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 le this proposed legislation really deals with the allocation of resources and access to resources. Access to resources, the safe houses, the temporary um, emergency houses for victims to get themselves situated, ensuring that we have the connections. And this authority helps to put all of that in place because now we can connect with businesses in those various islands and say, I have somebody who's coming and da 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 and the partnership is already in place where you have everything set up and secured for the victim to now continue and live a productive life. And you know, on the face of it, it would seem like these things are, I'm gonna use a comment, are no-brainers. I mean, why is it that we just can't put legislation like this in place? What continues to be the impediment? Is it still the will? And Lisa, talk about the strategic plan. A few years ago, I think in 2016, 
the they had a task force, Jerome. That we're we'll good with tasks. Yeah, no, we'll but good they, with reports. they made excellent recommendations. I'm not just saying we're great excellent, with good but reports never and recommendations. And anywhere. they sit on shelves and collect never. dust. Sort of, we're great with those things. Yeah, let me say this: um, this particular act or bill, pardon me, that has been that we're trying to get passed. The first, I believe, reiteration of this bill was drafted in 2014. It was redrafted or amended pursuant to consultation in 2016. We're in 2022. So as you say, what causes it to stay there? I think some of it is will and dedication mm -hmm, to the process. Mm -hmm. But right now, why we are pushing, and it's, it's moving, it's moving. And in fact, they just had a symposium. But one of the things that disturbs me arising out of that symposium is that I understand they've sent it back for consultation and more input, and everybody's supposed to come forward with their ideas, and then they'll consider it, and then so on, so forth, so forth. And my thing is, look. This bill has been vetted, consulted on, it has been reviewed by stakeholders up to the last time, I think, just 2018, 2019. I was not a part of the review. I became involved and after that with NWAC. But I, there was a consultative process. My thing is, look, let's pass what we have. If we've got to go in and amend it, then amend it. But let's pass what we have. Let's get something yes. on the table. And let's move this ahead. I, I mean, it cannot be so catastrophically wrong that we need to spin our wheels for another four or five years in further consultation. What I would also say, I want to just clarify with the authority, just to make it very clear. What happens under the bill is it creates the authority. The authority then has a trust. And then there's another organization down below. All of the NGOs join that organization that organization vets them federation. for the federation, Join, vets them for their authenticity and that they're legitimate. The federation or the authority, et cetera, can raise money. It is funded. They then, if NGO A or B, maybe FOAM, maybe FOAM needs funds. FOAM can write a proposal, mm -hmm. put it forward before them. They review it. If they review it, they send it up to the trust. The trust pushes down the funds. All of these organizations have different purposes. So FOAM assists family of all murder, murder victims. Teen Life Skills uh, uh, helps pregnant ladies. The Crisis Center, mm -hmm. the this. And many of them have shelters associated with them. So by funding them, you are decentralizing the services that are needed to assist the public to a deal with the larger social issue. And that's the problem. That's the plan. Mm -hmm. We need the act. And as, as I so say so many times here, Rome burns while Nero fiddles. <laughs> <laughs> the Bahamas ratified the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women in 1993. The Inter-American Convention on the Prevention, Punishment, and Eradication of Violence Against Women in 1995. UN Convention Rights Children in 1991. Mm -hmm. And the UN Convention Rights Persons with Disability in 2015. So all of these, all of these UN conventions we have ratified, we have signed on to, we've agreed to be a part of, we've agreed to implement, what is the problem? What is holding us up? We continue to be a part of these wonderful international organizations mm -hmm. and all, you know, we go to New York and you know, all these great, uh, to all these great events and we're smiling and signing and shaking hands and then nothing. What is holding us up? That's a good question. That's the question we're asking. What is holding us up? Why hasn't all of these um, bills and treaties been implemented? And honored. And honored. And that's why we made the demands and said, we're demanding what was promised. You signed on to these. It's only right that you deliver. And that's what we're expecting to help to change some of the the, the red tape and the blockages that's been happening for us to be able to move forward can be done in passing these legislations to help to push them forward. That authority is key, key, especially for the NGOs who the government needs to partner with to make these services available throughout the communities. If you're serious and you invest in your human resources, in your people, 
we will lessen the crime and the situations that's happening in these countries. People are angry. It boils down to economics. If I can't feed my family, take care of my, my children, the young boys, I want to take care of my girl and take her out and have a good time, but I have to work. And if I can't work, what am I going to do? I'm going to turn to crime. Mm -hmm. So we have to make sure that these laws and legislations are in place to ensure that the people get the type of training that, that they need in the communities. All of these um, different constituency offices and community centers are supposed to have activities going on. What do they do? It just sits there. You can't even hear of how to, people don't even grill, know how to fill out a resume. Out, grill out an grill out. Time. What, what are you mm -hmm. doing to empower the people in your communities? And that's all we're asking for. To make sure that the programs and the things are in place and the legislations are in place to support We've got to go to a break, and Lisa, but I, I want to get your take on this as well. The fact that we have signed on to all of these um, international obligations, but yet we still are lagging in implementation and in honoring these, what kind of message does that send to the rest of the world about the Bahamas, the country that we live in, the people? Um, mm -hmm. What is that... What does that say about us to our global neighbors and partners? Um, sadly, I, I think it can only say that we are not to be taken seriously, mm -hmm. not on these issues. Um, I think on the larger issue in terms of discrimination against women, I think that the Bahamas has a black eye. Mm -hmm. um, we really look regressive. We, we look like we're not of these times. We keep company with countries that... People think of us, you know, almost failed states when it comes to women's rights. Um, and so, you know, we, we have to progress and we have to do better. Jerome, I don't know, quite frankly, what has happened to us in the Bahamas. I, I don't know where, where we lost the way. Because in some respects, we are actually quite progressive. You do see women in leadership roles. Yes. But it's just as though there's a mental block when you say, well, let's codify this in some way. No. We don't want you to be equal. But we, allow, we, we participate in some ways. The amount that we are paid may not be the same, but it, we, we're just regressive, and um, we're not minded to allow women to have equal rights in the Bahamas. Um, and the women do it to ourselves as well, uh, sadly. I, I was about to say, you know, um, so, some of your greatest opposition comes from mm -hmm. other women. Yeah, the, yeah. The, worst, the worst comments I've seen on news pieces that I've done have been from women. Sure, ladies, uh, we have to take, uh, I think this is our final break. Uh, we still got a little bit more to talk about. You're watching On the Record, our topic tonight, Mindset of Equality. We'll see you on the other side of this one. So the project really pays itself back. Correct. Set up a, a, um, at the conference, uh, uh, more uh, the school. As a journalist, I always have to focus on the facts, and sometimes that means going to investigate for myself. On the record, Thursdays at 8 p.m. right here on RTV. And we're back. Mindset of Equality is our discussion topic. Our guests are Podesta Moore and Lisa Bostwick, Dean Ladies, I don't know when I've had... Such a good discussion, and you know, for the benefit of the public, you should have the off camera discussion. But anyway, <laughs> that, that, that's for another show. So, um, our topic, as we said, mindset of equality. I, I, I want to know though, do you feel that women are still uh, not considered equal? And why is it that in 2022 there are so many people in this society who don't see women as their equals? I think you would have. We would have started to speak to it, Lisa, in, in our last segment. But why is that still such a pervasive feeling? Or is that, some, or is that still a global issue? I don't, I don't think it is. It, it is an issue in other countries. I'll right. put it that way. But mm -hmm. I wouldn't necessarily say it's a global issue. Right. Um, and honestly, Jerome, I'm somewhat confounded by where we find ourselves. Um, as I indicated, in many respects, we think of ourselves, we men and women, think of ourselves as equal. But it would seem that when it comes to our rights to convey citizenship, 
our rights to our body if we marry, mm -hmm. something goes a little bit different in some of our thoughts. And um, I would want to say that it seems to me that the closest I have come to understanding it is that it seems to me to be based in very traditional religious beliefs. I, you you, you actually took my next About question because rules. I was going to ask how much of it is religious based because whenever I hear the references to man having dominance over woman or being mm -hmm. the head of the household, it's usually in a religious context and supported by religious leaders. Yeah, right. So I think that it is comes out of the preachings in our churches. That is That is what I suspect is the undercurrent. It seems to be the undercurrent of most objections that I hear to any suggestion that you should um, have some sort of rights along those lines. I told you my worst comments come from women. Um, I've seen a post suggesting that I was of the demon. I was, a, I was a demon and these people, all of us who are pushing this issue, we are of the devil because we are trying to go against the word of God and we are just power hungry. How do you address that, Pradesh? I mean, how do you, how do you even begin to face into that? You know, I, sometimes I, I, when I hear it or I see it, I just sort of, I, I shut down. I just go quiet. I, was, I don't even have the energy to address this sometimes. But it's something, that, you know, how do you even tackle something like that when, when these things, are, and, you know, disappear to land? I don't want the church people to buy yeah. me. You know, but how do you begin to address that when this, you know, this is really born out of our religious you know, being out of our upbringing and, and what we are taught. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of public education, mm -hmm. um, talking to women, families, and not just the women, the men also, and helping them to understand that if they want to go religion, religious, um, then we could talk about the Bible, how we're equal. How could you not see us as equal when God made us equal? And then you talk about the fact that um, women are, are made from the rib of the man and all of the stuff and she's supposed to walk behind and submit and all that stuff no the day even in this um time zone that we live in women are the breadwinners in a lot of cases women are the ones out there going and working and making the money and taking care of the homes and the families and to come home now and tell them i'm not equal to you you have to submit to me regardless of what it is that i am doing so it takes education to know that we are one together we're partner in a marriage partner in a relationship, put those old traditions aside. It's going to take a lot of education, talking to women, letting them know what their rights are as a human being, those basic human being rights. And I, our law have to now put in place some things to protect us as women. What then, though, is the role of the educator in the educational system? Because, you know, it's hard to, to change the mind of an adult. Yes. But if you are molding the minds of children or exposing them to more, you know, that, that may seem to me to be a bit of an easier road. It, um, it, it is. <laughs> Just before you go on, Lisa, I had a, a program t 2017 where I was the director of this IDB program that was funded. And of course, we hired people. My husband happened to have been the contractor. I, as a director, in my meetings, talking to everybody, and you know, the children in that program, the youth in that program were upset with me that the mere fact that I talked to your husband in that manner, and I'm like, wait, we're not here on the job as husband and wife. I am the director of the program. He's the, the construction manager. And if he doesn't have the materials for you to be able to do what you have to do, it's a problem. I'm doing my, my job as a director. I had to really break it down to those young people of the different roles that you're having. It's almost a, how dare you? Yes, it was how, they were upset. And I found it later on why they were upset that you don't talk to your husband like that. I'm like, no. And my husband had to actually come in <laughs> during a meeting and we had to actually explain to them what we're doing. I'm not demeaning him or undermining him or whatever. I'm saying you have a responsibility to this program. Interesting. That Interesting. you have to have the materials in order for us to be successful. Lisa, I need you to that jump in. That was the mindset. We've got a final question. Um, the only thing that I would like to say, and I, it's not a direct answer to your question, but mm. in fairness, and we're not here to deal with marital rape, but in fairness, on the recent Eyewitness News report, the head of the Christian Council did say that the, they had come together and that they had agreed that marital rape should be an offense. Yes. So that's progress. I yes, only say that, that in the progress. context of my having said that I think it's an underlying religion 
issue that's making women say this. Mm -hmm. it, it needs to come from our educators, but please realize, you can only as a teacher teach what you believe. Mm -hmm. And so if it's still fundamentally your belief that this is not incorrect, then you're not going to teach it. I want to end um, a bit on <laughs> how we started, and very, very good point. We've invited him on the show to talk about marital rape, but he says, let, you know, let, 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 let their recommendations sit for a moment and right. let government address. That's a whole other show. Yes. But um, in, in a number of these instances where we've seen violence against women and children, we would have seen statements come from the office of the spouse of the prime minister. And I do want to applaud her yes. and that office for that because I think that's a significant step. Um, and it really speaks to where we are as a country. And the spouse of the, uh, you know, the prime minister is not just a figure on the side of him anymore, but certainly has a role. And so I, I want to commend her in that office. Uh, we also have a female state minister for social services. Um, what do you see, though, as the role of these women who are in these public um, offices, who serve in these roles, and while the spouse of the, uh, of the prime minister is not an elected role, she still does have a, a significant role in politics. But what do you see as the role of those women in politics? Uh, and I dare to say without being political, because sometimes the message is lost in the messenger because we don't agree. <laughs> I like how you stop and look straight at me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, let me say this. I, I, I was recently in the Senate. Mm -hmm. And that's another comment I always get. Why are your mouth so big now? You're loud now. Why you didn't do this before? When, what I appreciate and I want to say to my parliamentary sisters, they're not parliamentary sisters in the sense that I'm not there, is that I understand. I understand the confines of being in parliament and being a part of your political organization. So I did advocate, but I advocated within that parliamentary mm -hmm, system. Mm -hmm. There are times I spoke out in public from the Senate, but no, I didn't come on to shows and advocate because my government was there. So I, I, I advocated with my colleagues. So I would say to those in parliament now, we would expect you to do the same. We would expect you to push these issues behind the doors with your parliamentary colleagues to keep banging the drum with us. I applaud Madam President of the Senate Madam President of the Senate, she taken it to the she taken it to the floor. Mm -hmm. Every single time she feels inclined to do so, she's out there saying what needs to happen. And I applaud her. So every one of us who are in the public life and who decide to go in Parliament have to decide. And I would just encourage them though to please join us in saying, not just in saying that it's going to happen, but hold their male colleagues' toes to the fire. Absolutely. We are wise. We know what the process is. So it's not enough to tell us that, oh, we're going to lay the gender violence away, or we may. We need you to lay it over. We need you to debate it in Parliament. We need you to send it to the Senate. It needs to pass in the Senate. It needs to come back to you. Then it needs to be enacted. Absolutely. Which means bring it into force. And then we need you to, to uh, put in place the various people on the committees created by that act. And I can assure everyone that the members of WU, the members of the organizations within WU, and every woman that we hope will join our cause, we're going to educate them as to that Absolutely. process, and we're going to hold the toes to the fire ourselves from here. We're at step one. Bring the bill, pass the bill. But it isn't going to stop right now. There, you're on notice. We're going to tell you when is it going to be enacted. And then we're going to tell you, give us our committees. Lisa Podesta, Absolutely. Uh, we are I couldn't have said it better. No, I, I, that's a good way to <laughs> That's end. a good wrap-up. Yeah, that's why I look at you. I know he's going to bring it perfect, home. Perfect, you, perfect, perfect. Like the icon. The yes, team. yes, yes. <laughs> I brought up the gold. <laughs> yes. Ladies, I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. So not because of the ma Not because of the subject, but because of the work that you're doing. Yes. And I applaud you. And as I say so many times, I say we need more groups who are advocating on behalf of yes. our people who are not the frontline politicians. Absolutely. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Jerome, can I say something again? Sure. We thank the fourth estate. Yes. The fourth estate, sometimes y'all are reaching out to us more than than Prodesta certainly can keep up with. Yes. Yeah. So, we so we thank the fourth estate. Yes. And thank you for answering. Thank you. Thank and you. thank you for coming. Ladies, we are out of time. Thank you so much, though, for joining us tonight on the record. And we wish you uh, and your group every success. Women United. 
Listen out for the name, folks. They are, they are continuing to do great work and help however you can in the work that they're doing for this legislation and to continue to move against gender-based violence. You've been watching On the Record. Be sure and join us again next week for another topic which directly affects the lives of Bahamians. Until then, I'm your host, Jerome Sawyer. See you next time.